my name is uh, Lily Ye. I am an artist, barefoot artist. Uh, the reason I call myself barefoot artist is because I establish an organization called the barefootartist.com. And the motto is taken from the Chinese barefoot doctor that they take their knowledge and their instruments and in a little suitcase and they travel to remote places where people uh, usually don't have access, uh, ex they didn't have ac uh, access to medical treatment and they would just go, there's the great needs. And then they would just practice their crafts and help people to heal. And when they're done, they close their suitcase then they move on. So that's been like my model. And uh, so how I started um, is actually um, in the, uh, I mean, I was trained in classical Chinese landscape painting. I think my art is rooted in that great tradition. It is about longing, it, it is about expressing an ideal uh, place where it is serene, it's um, poignant, it's dynamic, it's um, still, it's luminous, and it contains the tension of light and dark. And, um, but, and also it's encased in a capsule of beauty. And so when you look at the beauty, you feel soothed, but yet at the same time, you feel the, um, the struggle, the conflict, the dynamics and the pushing um, forces of the opposite, but somehow they find the balance, just like the Chinese diagram, the yin and yang, and it's dynamic. It, but it's balanced on the thin thread of, uh, of the equal forces. And um, so anyway, um, I, uh, I uh, came to America from, uh, from China. I was born in China, grew up in Taiwan, and came to University of Pennsylvania to study art in the graduate school. And uh, so after that, I... Uh, have been teaching in um, colleges, university. I taught at the University of the Arts for near th three decades. But all that time, uh, I felt something was missing. Uh, I was looking for that. And by chance, I had the opportunity to venture into North Philadelphia. I was invited by an African American that da uh, dancer and choreographer, uh, the late Arthur Hall, very talented and visionary and whatever. And his base, his headquarters is located in North Philadelphia. And at that time, it was a very big um, po uh, poverty stricken um, neighborhood. It was like a ghetto. And uh, he had been abandoned lot next to his headquarter. And he asked me uh, whether I'm willing to turn that abandoned lot into uh, an art park. And I, uh, I had no notion how to do it, but I thought um, that was in the late uh, 80s. And I said, oh, well, everybody is writing a grant, so why don't I try it? And so I did, and then I got a very little bit of money. And then um, at, at, at that time, uh, the one block was turned into a 10 block area because of all the abandoned houses around that one block was leveled by the city. And uh, I, I was thinking, well, this is not doable. And all the professionals say that uh, you shouldn't do it because uh, you don't have enough money. You're from the outside. People can just destroy everything uh, you build. It, 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 many different reasons that one shouldn't venture in. And as I was trying to withdraw from the uh, proposal and my inner voice spoke and says that you need to rise to the occasion Otherwise, the best of you will die and the rest will not amount to anything. And so it was guided by that inner voice. I ventured in, but I didn't know what I was doing. And so 
I figured that maybe we can do something very modest with children. And that's when I start to work with children um, on the street. And then so, and I, because I was not an expert, I have no experience with building outside. And so uh, Arthur Hall told me, you have to find Jojo. He didn't have a job. He lived in a semi-abandoned house. So I finally convinced him to help me. And that's how we started. And he from the neighborhood and uh, a jobless and children on the street, not having a, uh, much money at all. But we just started to do something that was fun, that seemed uh, you know, meaningful for that moment. And so we built, a, uh, the first summer, we turned the little lot into a kind of garden. And that was so, um, so, so something, uh, really happened in that um, uh, in that uh, interconnection and working together, a group of people not really knowing how, but trying to address to a problem, turning an abandoned lot into a, a, a park. It affected me deeply. So I went back the second year. I went back the third year, eventually, volunteers joined me and neighborhood adults who used to laugh at us begin to um, take trust in our effort. And I think the joy of the children convinced them that it is something worth uh, doing. So that's the trust from eventually we continue to build because there are hundreds and hundreds of abandoned lots and houses in North Philadelphia. So we gra gradually expand. And in the expansion, we realized that children came, you, you have to have a program for them. That's how we started the children's program. And then when adults came, they're looking for jobs. Then we start to have a uh, job training program. We start to have jobs for adults. And then teenage to come in. We have after school programs. Program. We have the uh, eventually um, rites of passage you know, get program, and then we have economic development and so forth. That's how it begin to address the need of community needs, a commun address the community needs. And that's how a humble art project begin to become a community development project. So I didn't know uh, when I first started but eventually it became so intense and so, um, so I became so engaged. And all the work I do is very creative because there was, everything is breaking, you have broken. And so you have to figure out uh, how to make it work. It was creative, not only just in art, although, um, although that is our main vehicle of expression but then we ventured into education we went we went into job training economic development and renovating houses healthy food and so on and so forth and uh, so i quit my job as a tenure professor at the university of the, of the arts so that i can completely dedicate myself to building the village of arts and humanities. That's what we call it um, from the summer, humble summer project turned into the uh, and nonprofit arts organization. And so after 18 years, I wanted to leave and pursue my, um, pursue a bigger dream, how to take this model, which is from uh, grassroots up, which is um, a, create a space that is open, equal, in, um, inclusive, inviting, creative, and joyful. And it's a democratic, joyful platform. And to do it in other people, other places in needs in the world. And so in 2004, I was invited to a conference in Spain, in Barcelona. 
and it was like a um, Grameen, you know, the bank for the poor, a Grameen bank about micro lending. So I went there, and there I heard uh, a, a, a person from Rwanda. His name is Jean Bosco Musana Ukirande. He spoke about the suffering of his country and his people in, in Rwanda. And I was so touched by the depth of, he, of feeling in his speech. And so, and I was on my way to a dump site community in Korokocho outside of Nairobi. I, 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 I was doing a project there. And I asked him whether he can wait for, pick me up at the airport because I wanted to visit him at the airport. And then we go together to his hometown, Gisini, and to visit Rwanda for myself. And then to, uh, to, to feel what he was presenting and see whether there was any possibility. So we neither of, we, neither of us had any idea um, but we gave each other a chance. So I went in 2004 and he picked me up uh, at the Kigali airport. As you know that Kigali is three hours from Gisini. So he took me there. He took me to see, to visit the genocide, uh, I mean, genocide memorial and the survivors village in the area of Ru Guerrero, which is a, a little bit, maybe 20 minutes um, drive from uh, Gisini, the beautiful, beautiful city at the lakeside. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so, um, so when I, I saw the uh, genocide memorial, um, the old genocide memorial, my heart sank because uh, you couldn't tell, the, tell that it was a memorial. It was just a big slab of rough concrete on the platform. And on top of it, there are four posts with rusted corrugated roof. And then there were dried, um, several dried bouquet of flowers. There was no marking, no nothing. And I said, in my, if my loved ones were buried here, I, my heart would never heal. And then later on, we heard from the survivors. And then they say that uh, every time we saw the, um, the old memorial, our heart breaks. It's like we were killed the second time because they, during the raining seasons, they are soaked in mud. The bones were soaked in mud and, and whatnot. And so I, th I didn't know um, what I would do, but I, I just said that I would like to bring beauty to the building of a, mem of a memorial. That was all, that was the seed thought. Then he brought me, Jean Bosco brought me to visit uh, um, Survivor's Village in, uh, uh, in Uguerrero. And um, the village is actually lovely because of the greens. Rwanda is so beautiful. The hills and the greens, very lush. And then when I get into deeper, then I realized the frozen grief felt by the people, you know, the sun is bright, but we saw no adults. And the only people who came out is little children born after the genocide. And uh, then Jean Bosco said that, though it's not really a village because people didn't know each other. After the genocide and uh, got the government uh, it built up those houses very quickly. It didn't have facilities, no water, no facilities, no electricity, and no floor, no window. And so it's just a volcanic soil. That's your floor. And uh, when you close the, uh, the shutter, it's complete darkness and uh, no income and no family. And so people didn't trust their neighbors because they didn't know them. Government 
put the most destitute, in most in need into those um, houses. And so they suffer in isolation. And so um, I wanted to do bring color to the, um, I said, the least we can do is some action. Like it's just the so frozen in the, I call it the blackness in noon, in, 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 at noon. The sun is so bright and uh, so lush, the greens, but people are frozen in the darkness in their own houses. So I, so I came back the second day. And uh, so I did left, developed some idea about the genocide memorial presented to the government and get their um, support, get, uh, get their permission to continue raise funds and to start building the uh, genocide memorial. And then I also brought a three members of volunteers so we conducted workshop for adults and we started to paint their houses in bright geometrical uh, colors. And then that simple action provided platform to bring color, to bring action, to bring collaboration and to bring joy through working together. That's the beginning of um, building the, uh, tr uh, transforming the uh, survivor's village. And then when I, um, when we left, we left all the paints and whatever um, with the villagers, they continue to paint. And they are so talented. They painted their dreams. They painted goats and cows and uh, um, and uh, motorcycle and uh, helicopter, computer, and there was even a mask there, okay? So they, are, they painted their dreams. And then they told us that there is a sense of belonging now because their house is different pattern, is different from another house. And then um, their dreams are on, their, the, on the painted wall. And so when we went back, every time I, uh, the barefoot artists uh, came back and they asked for more, they didn't have uh, water. So I said, Rwanda has two raining seasons. So why don't we install uh, rain water collecting devices? You know, the huge uh, water collecting uh, barrels for, the, for all the families. So we installed that and then they can collect the water. And then they didn't have uh, electricity. So eventually we brought a a solar engineer from Maine and then to uh, the Skylight Company. And then so um, he taught uh, Richard, yeah, Dr. Richard, and he taught the villagers how to assemble solar panels. You know, solar panels assembled at the Ruguerero Survivors Village. And then younger women, who wanted to learn sewing. So we, we got the teacher for them and we create the workshop and we create the workshop for basket weaving for the el more elderly uh, women. And we have um, education program weekends for the children and so on, so, so forth. And so, and then we have goat re rearing because gold is the fast, uh, fastest way to bring wealth to people. So we gave people goats. And then we also launched my coal landing program. My partner, Jean Bosco Musana, he used to be regional director for Red Cross. He understands how to organize and he set up the committee so people can earn money, learn, have micro funds and launch a private mini business. So with all this, and we did this for a period of uh, seven years or so. And finally, they told us, Mama Lily, that's what they call me, Mama Lily. Every time you came, we needed something. But during the ninth year, they say, we are now self-sufficient. And then they gave me a, they, wrote, they, they weaved a beautiful uh, staff 
with beaded yellow and green. And he said, when you came back, you someday, you might be wobbling a little bit. You need the staff to help you, but we are fine now. We are good. We are fine now. So that's the, um, and village now is doing very well. Finally, the government is um, is um, uh, is replacing the old houses with all new houses. So they have the floor. They have electricity. They some have television and uh, whatever water and. Um, so it's very good, very good. So what we did here is we created the, um, the art, people working together, trying to find solution and trying to find community support. That gives hope for the future. And that's healing collectively, especially the genocide memorial. And they told me, the, the, what's so healing about Genocide Memorial is that we didn't just build the memorial for them. I get them together, organize the survivors, and I ask them, what would you like to see? And then they say, Mama Lily, you cannot build over the old one because we, we, it's not the proper way to bury the bones. He said, you have to retrieve the bones. You have to dig into the ground. The bones need to be buried under the ground according to the Rwanda, uh, Rwanda history, uh, Rwanda custom. And then so, and, uh, and then they say that, um, it, 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 and also we asked them, um, what would you like to be written on the, on the memorial uh, slab. And they come together and told us the words. You know, this is to, to memorialize 1994 genocide. Um, and we will never forget, you die like heroes, and so on. Those are the words presented to us by the survivors. And then uh, I, when, when um, and then they also told, when they asked me to, to touch the bones, I was totally frightened and trembling because it is, deep wounds in the Rwanda people collectively, and it touches the, uh, the pain of the Rwandan soul. And I was so afraid um, to take the responsibility. And I said, okay, um, there, at the village, there's no water, there's no electricity at that time, no income, no wealth. And the Barefoot Artist is a very modest, uh, a nonprofit organization. So I said, Rwanda being so damp, you know, two raining season, how do you prevent the bones from getting moist and getting soft? So finally, our, our solution is the effective, but low tech, but highly artistic. And that is the using, using the um, technique of mosaic making. And so mosaics is broken tiles. We can afford to buy a lot of broken tiles. So I brought the art of making mosaics to the villagers. I taught, showed them how to do it. And when we do the mosaics, the village turned out. So now the separate families, they have a platform for people to step in and to do the mosaics together. And mosaic is labor intense. You have to pee, you have to adhere each broken pieces one by one onto the surface. And then you have to ground it. And then you have sand it. You have to sand it until each piece sparkle like jewels. And then it will be beautiful. So there they are making these beautiful mosaics. 
and then they make their wor words sh shine. And then this monument contains the bones of their loved ones. And this is how the the building the, um, a true connection made possible. And mosaics is wonderful because it's broken, just like the people who participate into uh, in the project with broken lives. But working together through creativity, through collaboration, cre in creating beauty, we create hope for the future. And so during the annual festival, not festival, annual morning on April 7th. I was there to witness the event on um, the 15th anniversary. And then survivors, people came and mourned their dead. When they descend into the uh, bone chamber, some of them not only have to see the coffins that contain the bones of many families. Some of them have to open the coffins to look at the bleached the bones, the source of pain and ripping apart of your heart. And some people, many people screamed, hauled, collapsed. And then that to me, that bone chamber, that empty air space become the receiver of the pain and the grief. And that is the place where healing began. And I feel um, that um, so collectively, um, it, there is the place for people to pour their sorrow, to remember their lost. And the survivor told us that now our loved ones can come home into this place of beauty with dignity. Okay, so this is collective healing. And yet I get to know the uh, people I work with very well, like the young women in the sewing group and the uh, uh, more older group in uh, basket weaving. And I still see the grief personally in their heart. And I said, well, how could you tell, get them to tell their stories? And maybe that you have to tell the stories where it hurts. It's to heal. It's like doctor, if you have some growth inside, blister somewhere, and you go to a doctor, doctor has to open it up and take it out. It's painful, but that is uh, necessary. So I just say that they need to tell their stories. And so I didn't just go to them not knowing them. This is the third year, third year maybe into the project. And uh, so there's the mutual trust. They knew that I was there trying to provide a space that we can build the future together. And so, so I get them together. First, uh, we, I think this workshop has 12 young women. And so we just come together and then we want to share. I, I said, well, maybe we can remember your loved ones in writing and in drawing. And suddenly the room came quiet, became quiet, and their face just frozen. And some started to cry. And I said, but don't go there. You know, think of when you were younger, when you were your parents there, happy days. And some cried harder. He said, those times were no more. And so then I said to myself that I couldn't really do it by myself. But they, I realized that they were devout Catholics. And I say, why don't we pray? Why don't we pray for guidance? And why don't we hold hands together? And so some began, it led in singing, in prayer and singing. And when we begin to sing, when we hold together, I think something begin to build. 
So at the beginning, that they wrote down their parents' name, and then or whatever they remembered their childhood. And at the beginning, it was stick figures and very simple words. But every time I I I conducted the drawing workshop for them. You know, in the afternoon, and then every time I went, I do this workshop, intensive workshop, on morning storytelling in the afternoon, and it's drawing class. And then I inspired them with、um, drawing technique and also、um, other artists' work that deal with their pain. And so slowly, slowly, they. Begin to blossom. They begin to be. Some of them begin become so good in storytelling and the, in、um, uh, in drawing. And that's when I see the personal healing along with the collective healing. And so the the way to do, I mean, from my experience, is actually it is. You, how to get another person? How do you do the healing? I think it's just by really be there for the other person, and just be present, and then listen. Just listen to their story. I think that's the beginning.